Morning, everyone. Um, does anyone else here um, use Twitter? No. <laughs> so Twitter is quite, I find it quite funny, to be honest. It makes kind of all the mess that's going on in the world. So you basically see a lot of comical things going on. Um, and uh, people's opinions on the world, um, which is, I find quite funny. And one of the Twitter accounts I follow, um, it's called Very British Problems. Um, and it basically exaggerates British life. So, for example, uh, one I read yesterday was um, things I definitely do in the supermarket. I apologise to someone who rams a trolley into my leg. I buy a product with an expiry date that will run out by the time I'm back at the car. Um, and I try, this is the new one, I try to recreate some smiling at someone while wearing a mask by simply scrunching my eyes up. I'll try that later on. But one of the posts that over the last year, um, that happened to be posted during a storm um, that we had in the UK, was um, things to do during a storm, the top ten things. And these were, watch the storm through the window, watch storm on telly, listen to the storm, tell people to listen to the storm, read about the storm, talk about the storm, post online about the storm, have a sleep, <laughs> do a jigsaw, cancel plans. Anybody do any of those things when the storm is on? I suspect so. Um, but one of the other things um, that I've spotted over the last couple of years, particularly during the pandemic, um, are these artwork that is on the screen by a guy called Charlie Mackesy. Um, he's a Christian, part of HDB Church in London, who basically has used his creative giftings to bring something of God's perspective to the world. And these have been hugely popular. Um, you may have seen, you see them um, posted even in um, some of the hospitals around the country. Some of these have been turned into big works of art, posted in hospitals. And particularly over the pa pandemic, his artwork has been a real encouragement to many. Because let's face it, the last, we've been saying for the last one, the last 18 months, it's not, but the last 22 months, for the last 22 months, we have all been in the same storm. But not necessarily all in the same boats. We've all faced uncertainty. We've all had different times where we've had eyes of faith or eyes of fear. We've all faced all kinds of storms within one big storm. What does it look like? There are storms of loss and sorrow. Storms of suffering, storms of confusion, storms of failure, storms of loneliness, storms of disappointment and regret, storms of depression. Storms of uncertainty and second-guessing. And today, we're going to look at the Bible. We're going to look at one part of Jesus' life in Mark's Gospel. It's actually recorded in some of the other Gospels as well. Where Jesus invites um, his disciples into a boat. They didn't know a storm was coming. And I want us, as we kind of listen to this narrative, to perhaps you kind of picture where we're at at the moment where we might have been. This journey that we're on through Mark's Gospel is about what does it look like to go on an ultimate adventure. And storms is part of that ultimate adventure. It's unpredictable, but there can be life-changing moments within it. As Jesus says, follow me. Let's read from Mark 4, verse 35 onwards. Just picture the scene. That day, when evening came, he said to his disciples, let's go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along, just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat, so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping. On a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the, rebuked the wind and the waves. Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down and he was completely calm. 
He said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. So far in Mark's narrative in, the, in his book, we've seen that Jesus' has, disciples have followed him around. They've listened to him. He's released and empowered 12 of them to have a particular share in his ministry. But they're not actually using that yet. That's coming later in Mark chapter 6. You can read how they've been in power, but they're not using that. Basically, they've followed him around. They've heard his teaching. He's explained in a more depth to this smaller group of 12 some of his teachings. Yet at this point in the narrative, they don't actually know what they think about him. They've heard a lot of stuff. But what do they think about Jesus? So after a day of teaching, Jesus gives no explanation for his desire to travel across the Sea of Galilee in the evening. Instead of waiting until the morning, which would have been a lot safer trip, he says, let's go now, in the evening. Often it was said that when, after these long days when they were kind of teaching and there was healing stuff going on, they'd go back to the disciple Peter's house in Capernaum where they would stay. But this time, it was into the boat. So the Sea of Galilee, they got into the boat on the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee is apparently, is, I've been doing some research on this, is 13 miles long, 8 miles across. It would have taken them 2 or 3 hours to row to the other side of the lake. Now I had to do a little bit of research because I have to say, I've heard this story many, many times. And I have the wrong picture of what the boat looked like. I have the wrong picture of what the Sea of Galilee looked like. <coughs> Apparently these first century fishing boats are believed to have been about um, eight and a half metres long. They could easily hold eight to fifteen people. That sounds quite crushed to me. The Sea of Galilee is, is the lowest freshwater lake in the world. It's 680 feet below sea level. It's surrounded by hills and mountains. The hills on the east side are 2,000 feet high. And on top of these mountains, the air is really dry and very cold. Around the Sea of Galilee, it's warm and very moist air. So the extreme difference in the temperatures and pressures results in a strong southern wind storms rising up. That's for those who are into that kind of weather stuff, that's why it happened. So because it, this Sea of Galilee is, is a relatively small, shallow lake, this causes its waters to be easily stirred up by great winds, causing great waves and great dangers to the boats. And this is what happened on this particular evening. A sudden fierce windstorm rose out, out of nowhere with violent winds and massive waves crashing over against the boat. One way after another tossed the boat. But they were relentless. But let's be honest, in life when storms come, it does feel like that. It feels relentless. The disciples didn't get a chance to even regain their balance, to deal with the water, the damage from the last wave. It was called, causing them to hold on for dear life. There was no land or no end in sight. That's the intense landscape. That's the intense picture that we have. That's not like the picture I had in my head. When I've been on a boat, and it's a bit rocky, I'm feeling a bit kind of about to chuck up. I've been on the Irish Sea. My family live in Northern Ireland. I've had plenty of journeys where I'm like, oh, well, this is a bit queasy. This is not that. This is full on intense, relentless storms in a boat that is eight and a half metres long. There are two perspectives that I want us to think about today, to draw out from this. Is what was the disciples' perspective in the storm and what was Jesus' perspective? Because perspective changes everything. How we view situations, how we look is what is in front of us. 
So firstly, the disciples' perspective. Remember that some of those disciples were also, um, particularly Peter, Andrew, James, John, they lived near the Sea of Galilee. They were familiar with this moody weather, this kind of sudden storms. They were experienced fishermen, and they could handle a boat. But this storm was more than they could handle. They were in over their heads. And Jesus, he was asleep. The version in the, that's recorded in Matthew's Gospel says that they were looking for Jesus and woke him saying, Lord, save us. We are about to die. That's quite intense. That's kind of desperation, I would suggest. Jesus was sleeping in the stern of the boat, which would have been the back of the boat. Even in that area, although there might be, he might be blocked from some of the waves, he couldn't escape the tossing of that boat. It could not have been something easy to sleep through. Yet Jesus was asleep on a cushion, in a boat, in a windstorm. Everyone else is going, oh, we're about to die. He's asleep. I only know one other person who could sleep through chaos around him. Or his alarm going off for 45 minutes before his dad shakes him awake. But I won't mention his name. <laughs> no one else I know could sleep through that intensity. The apparent silence of God in times of troubles and storms often bothers us. We don't have any nice, neat, consistent theological answers. In the book of Psalms that we were just thinking about this morning, we read that often the writers like David struggled with this also. In Psalm 10 verse 1 it says, Why, O Lord, do you stand off? Why do you hide yourselves in time of trouble? In Psalm 22 it says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? My God, I cry out day and night, but you do not answer. By night I, have, I find no rest. Jesus himself, in responding to his Father on the cross, says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We struggle with the apparent silence, the apparent silence of but I want to remind us, God's silence is not his absence. God's silence is not his absence. We just don't see the whole picture. Faith steps in at those moments to trust God. Not looking at our emotions, but looking to God and clinging on. I look out today and I see people that have testified to that in storms that I've never been in, but they've clung on to God. A guy called Max Ricardo, I've read this quote many times over many years, wrote in a book years ago, to give us a glimpse of what it means to trust God in storms and when life is troubled. We can see it right throughout the whole Bible. He says this, faith is trusting what the eye can't see. I see a prowling lion Faith sees Daniel's angel. Eyes see giants. Faith sees Cain. Your eyes see your faults. Your faith sees your saviour. Your eyes see your guilt. Your faith sees his blood. Your eyes see your grave. Your faith sees a city whose builder and maker is God. Your eyes look in the mirror and see a sinner, a failure, a promise breaker. But by faith, you look in the mirror and you see a robed prodigal bearing the ring of grace on your finger and the kiss of your father on your face. For most of us, there's a big gulf between our hopes and dreams and our present reality. But faith lives in that tension. Faith lives in the tension between those extremes. We live in a day of small things, but dare to believe that God can change our world. That's where the disciples, their perspective was, decept, was desperation, fear, chaotic, uncertainty. They wake Jesus, 
He responds to creation and then questions the disciples where they're at. Verse 31, they were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. The instant calming of that storm didn't calm the disciples. They were terrified. They were afraid before, but then they were terrified. I don't know about you, but I'd be like, oh, how are we going to live? But then it took them to a next level. Suddenly their eyes were open to who Jesus is. They had journeyed, they'd heard the teachings, and they heard all that stuff, but at this moment, suddenly their eyes were opened to who Jesus is. He wasn't just about doing teaching. He wasn't just about performing miraculous signs. He had complete power over creation. The sudden storm and the sudden stillness seem to cause some brain overload for them. The sudden storm and the sudden stillness seem to cause a brain overload. They were in fearful awe of, of one who possessed authority to rebuke both the waves and the wind. Pete Gregg writes in his book, God on Mute, I've recommended it a million times here, it's a great book. He says this, Around the world today, many people in different situations will pray earnestly for Jesus to quell dangerous storms, just as he did on the night of Galilee. A hurricane may be threatening to destroy their livelihood. Four ten gales and mountainous seas may be about to drown them. Dark thunderclouds may be gathering ominously, threatening to spoil the long-awaited church barbecue event. However, most of these prayers will not work for an important reason. The storms against which we may sometimes pray are vital to the well-being of millions of people. Can God control weather systems? Yeah, of course. God is, son, is sovereign. But if God was to calm every storm, or even most storms, the balance of creation would be thrown off kilter with devastating and so, although he is sad, there may be well be crops destroyed. There may be church barbecues spoiled by the rain. Reluctantly, perhaps, God may say no to many prayers for the sake of the majority. What does that look like for us? What does it mean to us? And what is our response when we feel like God is asleep? God is silent. Alongside that, what do we feel like and what is our response when God demonstrates his power? I know for me, at times, I don't find life easy. I don't always handle my response to life well. I can find myself in the messiness of this struggle with God's silence, my own weaknesses, God's sudden revealed presence, and my own simple faith. That's all meshed up. And as I've been preparing this talk, I've had the words of their song buzzing around my head, which I want to, which show a simplicity of faith, but also the reassurance that God has got me. I am speaking this to myself, that's what's been so hard to prepare this talk. The words go like this. Spirit lead me, where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters, wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my feet would ever wander, and my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Saviour. I will call upon your name. I will keep my eyes above the waves. My soul will rest in your embrace. I am yours, and you are mine. picture there was from another storm when Jesus walked on the water he invited Peter to walk on the water but the response is the same I will call upon your name I keep my eyes above the waves my soul will rest in your embrace I am yours and you are mine 
So when Jesus awoke, he simply rebuked the wind. He spoke up to the wind and the, and the sea and he commanded the windstorm silence. Be still, shut up. He commanded the waves that were rocking the boat, be still. And it stopped. The waves disappeared. The lake became absolutely calm instantly. Completely calm. Nothing moved. The transformation when Jesus speaks into a storm was incredible. That's Jesus' perspective. He speaks into the storm and everything changes. So who has the power to change over the wind? Who has power over waters? Throughout the Old Testament, throughout the Psalms, you can read this, throughout the Psalms, it's this, often these images of creation. And throughout that, the, we see that the, the trademark of God, that he commands the wind and the water according to his pleasure and his will. He is the creator. The disciples would have known this from their Jewish culture, their scriptures at their time, their history. Yet on that day it dawned on them who Jesus is. And often there are in life there are breakthrough moments, often in the middle of the storm, when suddenly we realise who Jesus is either for the first time or to a deeper revelation. He feels our stuff, yet he is the one who began creation. Right at the start. He feels our stuff now, whatever is going through your heads, he feels it. Yet he is the one at the beginning of creation. He gets all the hidden stuff, the daily fears, the life-altering fears. Yet his perspective is above it all. Jesus got into the boat, was at peace, and stayed in perfect peace even when he woke. Because he knew who he was. He knew who he was. He knew his identity. Now I find that reassuring. I find it reassuring that he's got me. He's got you. At times I struggle, I wrestle. I'm kind of there at the moment, to be perfectly honest. I feel quite vulnerable. Oh, gosh. <laughs> in speaking this stuff, because I know it's for me. Jesus' perspective wasn't on the storm. It was in who he is before God. He was the one he created. And even when he got out of the boat the other side, he faced a man who had an evil spirit. You can read it further on in, in Mark's Gospel. He commanded to that man. He said, it's like constant encounters that would drain us. But Jesus' perspective knows the authority that is in him to speak transformation into the world. Be still. Be still. Jesus knew who he was. He still does now. And he still says, be still. In John 16, Jesus speaks to his disciples. He warns them that grief, that troubles will come. And he concludes by saying, I have told you these things, in verse 33, so that in me you may have peace. In this world you'll have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Jesus is encouraging us to step into his world, to trust him, to lean totally on him. Not on our past successes, not going back to the day, the good old days when I was, yeah, there and everything was all right. Not trusting in others, not on strategies, but totally on Him. Because He says He is the overcomer. So Jesus is God with skin on. He knew He needed to rest. He needed even, though being God of creation, a storm was coming, he still needed to rest. God is working in our, in our lives right now, whether we know it or not. And he's calling us to him. And he's working in whatever occurs in our lives for good. Romans 8, 28, it's not a fridge magnet thing. 
a deeply transformational thing. Where he says, and we know that in all things God works for those, for the good of those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. Let that be deeply transformational, not just a thing you stick on your fridge. We don't want to forget that God is there in the boat. He does know all. He does have all power. He is in control even when everything else feels out of control. And his timing is always perfect. He's still. He says. So where I land this morning, do you know that he has got you totally? Esther reminded, just in closing, last week of the words from 2 Chronicles 20. When the people of God were facing a large army, they said, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. This might be where you're at now. I think most of us over the last couple of years have been there at some point. But it might be you're fine. And if that's the case, then use this season to increase your capacity, your depth of relationship with Jesus. So that when the storms come again, and they will, then your resilience and your trust in Him is ready to lean deeper into Him. Use the season you're in to say to Jesus, change my perspective. Recognize that even if stuff is not going well, God seems silence. It doesn't mean he's absent. Sometimes we have to take practical steps. We have to reach out. We have to reach out to others. We have to say to God, God, would you change something now? What do I do? But remember Jesus' perspective is always all powerful. And in all these situations, there will be a bigger revelation of who he is. That's what the disciples experienced. They didn't realise that he was God of all creation. So my prayer as we respond is that God would, in, would increase and transform our perspective to be his perspective. That God would increase and transform our perspective to be his perspective. We're going to take a moment. Just maybe just in silence, think where, where you're at at the moment. What God is speaking to you, whether you're in the middle of the storm like the disciples kind of going crazy, or whether you're actually, I'm okay. What do you want to do in this season? Let's take a moment.